Hi, I'm Ed Amoroso from Tag Cyber, and I'm sitting here with my friend and neighbor, Bruce Flitcroft from 10 for you the founder and CEO. I am. It must be awesome to be the founder and CEO of a tech company. That's got to be pretty rewarding. Well, it's awesome to be the founder and CEO of a successful tech company. That's <laughs> good. Hey, how'd you get into this? What's your, a little bit about your background? Uh, I have always been in this. I started right uh, while I was in college. I was doing internships. Uh, some of the same places you started. I started mm. Bell Labs as an intern and started an yeah. IT engineering company out of college. Um, after that, got bought and helped build one of the first IT um, integrators, mm. took them public back in the 90s. And IT was different then, right? Very different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the Wild West. It was, it was. So the IT thing and that, that kind of an interface between IT and network, that's kind of where you guys focus, right? Mm -hmm. On how the network supports IT, am I thinking about that right? Is that yeah. sort of what, when you think about 10.4, is that what should come to mind? Yeah, as, as people use technology differently, the network is taking on a different role in mm -hmm. all of their IT. Yeah. Uh, and it's not the typical networks we built 20 years ago, yeah. and corporate networks, and we're not just leveraging uh, like a large carrier for our network. Our, you know, they become far more sophisticated in their, mm -hmm. Uh, they extend into all parts of our business. Yeah. So we're building networks that are designed to support growing and changing IT environments. Mm, and IT environments are very hybrid now, like yeah. a whole bunch of different things, right? Yep. Mm. Most, uh, most of the major advancements, though, are all coming in software in the last few years. The software yeah. ex explosion of technology there is causing a very different change in IT that the networks of the past really didn't think about. Everything mm -hmm. from, you know, artificial intelligence and IoT at the edge, and um, you know, mobility apps. So your so your network now expands way outside of your business. Your domain is flexing and changing as people move all over the world. Mm -hmm. So we think of our our network challenges a little differently than we did a decade yeah, or so ago. Yeah. How'd you come up with the idea of a utility? kind of uh, as a basis for IT infrastructure. Did that come from your customers? Did that come from a whiteboard? Where did you? It came from a whiteboard. Yeah. There were two ideas that really uh, coalesced. It was about 2008. Um, the idea of the domain of the mm -hmm. network. We were, re we, me and a couple of engineers were analyzing what the domain definition was and what it would become. And we were doing it because we were doing a lot of work as a sub a subcontractor for a lot of the larger telecoms. Mm. And their idea of the domain was their cloud, their uh, their wide area network that they were trying to move into the customer premise more and more past their traditional DMARC. And that domain was spreading and it wasn't solving, it was creating more problems for the end user customers than, than it was actually helping to solve. So we just came up randomly, I don't know, even know who <laughs> said it in the room, said, what if the domain of the network wasn't the carriers? What if it was the customer's domain? Mm. When we said kind of like you know their Active Directory you know domain, I said yeah. But what if you don't think about it in terms of the operating system? What if you think about it as the whole network was their domain? Mm. So well, that would that would create a million domains out there. They'd all be different. It would be too complicated. And well, what if it wasn't? And that became the, the what if question. Mm. What if we could make it so that the customer's domain wasn't so complicated yeah. and it was their domain and it served their evolving business needs and their IT needs. And that concept it was a little more profound than we realized at the time. Yeah. I think it matches like when you think protocol stack, as you go deeper into the protocol stack, things are more standard, right? Mm -hmm. You can duplicate things. I mean, you have massive duplication layer one, right, mm -hmm. obviously. But as you move up, I guess there's sort of that DMARC where you can provide something very repeatable. And then way up at the application level, everybody's going to live all over the map. Exactly. That's the crazy thing. Is that, is that the essence of what That is the essence. We've spent the last six years, seven years now, building very standardized architectures mm. from starting with layer one through yeah. layer two, three, right. and even into layer four, where everything is becoming a predictable standard. We're designing private domain networks using standardized Lego blocks for IT. Those Lego blocks we call ITUs, IT, IT units. Yeah. You know, an IT unit can be a circuit, it can be a piece of software, it can be a piece of hardware. The key is to use the same Lego over and over. 
and to do it in a way that you know exactly the definition in a period of time of 60 months of that building block, that, that IT building block, and make it predictable for 60 months. Yeah. Uh, turned out it was harder than it looked. <laughs> yeah. But we've done that. We've got, we've built um, you know, several, six reference architectures now that apply to different vertical industries. And there's about 250, 300, 180 different ITUs per reference architecture. And at first you think that's a lot of variable pieces, but in the IT world, that is a very small fraction of what most companies have in their IT domains. Mm. They have so many different brands and models and revision dates of everything from devices like wireless access points and switches to circuits from 19 different broadband and carrier providers and software versions all over the place. We decided that if we're going to build these customer-owned domain wide area networks, that we were going to have to use a static set of Lego building blocks that we could make predictable. And then once we got past the WAN, we would apply that to the local area network, yeah. the unified communications platform, right down into physical infrastructure at layer one, and standardize all those pieces. That's the piece that attracted me when you first told me about it over a year ago, uh, this idea of the standard pieces. I thought, wow, that's exactly what the security community, and that's sort of the connection, the security community clearly needs standardized parts that don't have all these unusual interfaces, mm -hmm. um, services exported that are unneeded. These are the, the, the that's the scourge of cybersecurity yeah. when, when parts are too chatty or have a yeah. bad interface. And you, you guys solve a lot of that with uh, the concept of we ITO. Do, we do, it the, it's the less is more concept. So yeah. there's so many, like take a hardware manufacturer in the IT space, they'll have a reference architecture. It's basically their catalog of everything they make. Yeah, yeah. We'll take that catalog of 10,000 different parts and we'll pick 18 out of it and say, these are the parts we're going to use. Yeah. Um, we'll do the same thing with various software licenses or code. And we'll break that down into predictable assets we call ITUs. And then that allows us to be able to make predictable the operations of it. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, our engineers do something called an ITU worksheet. It's an incredibly complicated piece of work, but it thinks through every variable of every patch, upgrade, every component, everything that plugs into an ITU, every activity, every person that's going to touch it in the next 60 months for provisioning, deprovisioning, and makes that predictable, assigns all the costs across the life cycle of it, and then builds that into our network observatory system to manage the device mm -hmm. or the circuit or the software package. And if anything changes that's not in that list, we know about it through our NCM systems. So we're just taking all the, we're breaking down all the things that go into an IT environment, defining them differently, limiting the number of options that we, we can use, and then we're making everything about it predictable cost-wise, activity-wise, over its 60-month life cycle. And then we remove it at the end of 60 months and replace it. One of the interesting dynamics we found, which was unintuitive math, was that if you keep ITUs in production more than 60 months, they become more variable, less secure, and more expensive, which is not how most IT departments think. Most, you know, the security guys may get that, mm -hmm. but the IT guy's trying to, you know, sweat his asset, get as much time out of it as he can, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, make as few changes to his environment because he doesn't have enough manpower. It turns out keeping it into one or two generations of technology actually reduces the number of attack points, variables, touches to the devices, et cetera. Let me use an analogy, see if this makes sense. When I buy a computer, there's a couple things I want to know about it. Maybe CPU, memory, whatever, but I don't care what your timing chip was, I don't care what cooling system you put in, I don't care what the I.O. subsystems mm -hmm. are, so many things I don't care about. Do you, are you getting to the point now where a lot of network buyers take a similar approach with, like, do you have customers who say, hey, I want to know a few things, but for the most part, you pick. Is, am, am I, is that right, or do you yeah. think more, or I'm guessing maybe network people are a little bit slower to give up on wanting to know exactly what's under the hood. There's but uh, are we moving in that direction? We are moving in that direction. We're seeing, a, particularly at the CTO and CIO levels, <clears throat> they're getting it. They're saying, listen, I really don't want to spend all my time trying to worry about 
these details. You take care of it. You take care of it. it, it pack, yeah. the, you, you, know, you know, the analogy we use is if you're buying your, in, your infrastructure, particularly the network as a, as a yeah. utility model, do you really want to know what the configuration on the wireless access point is as yeah. long as it always works, it's always yeah, secure, it's there. Yeah, I want assurance. Right? I want assurance. Right. Um, it's kind of like, would you ever ask the utility company what brand and model transformer they put in the poles down your street? Okay. And what well, they're, you know. Super geek, Mike, but I, I wouldn't ask that. Right. I wouldn't know what to ask. I, and that's what's happening. It started with cloud. You're seeing it happen with servers and storage. Now, all of a sudden, you're not asking what server, yeah. you know, AWS or Azure uses in the cloud. We're getting to the point where some of the more, you know, advanced customers are saying, I really don't care what switch model you're using. Now, 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 ironically, we tend to use very high-end, you know, tier one equipment, but we have fewer and fewer customers asking about it, mm -hmm. and that's at the CTO level. When you get down to the mechanic or the or the network administrator, he wants to know every little detail, mm -hmm. and it's nothing more painful for him than <laughs> the day we say, "These are the three models you get to pick from, <laughs> and these are the configs that come on them." He's like. But I want to do this. Well, you'll break the reference architecture yeah. when you start monkeying with it. Right. You're adding variables, and too many cooks spoil the soup is what we tell them. It's you know, true. We have a couple of engineers that have designed a bulletproof architecture, and as we, if we roll out that architecture, we guarantee it's bulletproof. The minute you start tinkering with it, it's not so bulletproof anymore. How important is security to the whole equation in your mind? It's enormous. We, we believe that we're actually changing the foundation of uh, the security profile of a client. Mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, we are rarely described as a security company, but by having constant monitoring on every device, standardized configs, auto failover on the configs if they change, um, the idea of every incident gets triaged and we correlate it to the network traffic. We control access on and off the network. We don't let any of the uh, tools reside outside the domain, so there's no reason to open up ports or, or leave. There's, it's changing a very fundamental set of um, uh, openings and uh, surface attack area problems that have existed in so many enterprises. Mm -hmm. And we're doing it because it makes it easier for us to operate the network. Yeah. It's not because we're trying to, we're not trying, we're not worried about adding features. We're trying to make the network always work. Do you see more security teams involved in this, the uh, procurement process as you go through? Not in the network. We usually touch them on the add-ons. So we've got, in, we've got embedded services for security within the network. So you're going to get syslog on all the devices. Yeah. You're going to get AAA, Radius, and TACX. To feed into the SIM and yeah. all that stuff, yeah. We've got all those as just standard. They don't cost anything. You know, DNS management, DHCP right. management. That's all included in the network. But then there's add-on features, right? Like uh, clean access, mm -hmm. um, you know, mobility tracking. Uh, is DDoS service. an add-on kind of thing? Like DDoS it is, protection? It is not. We do provide some malware protection mm -hmm. in, uh, it's, it, they're basically appliances so we add to the network. So you just be contracting off with a DDoS provider to, exactly. yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the area we talk to security teams the most is firewall strategy yeah, and selection. Right. So we have three different firewall strategies. One's a, One's a um, small premise-based network, one's an intelligent learning firewall, and one's a network-based firewall. Yeah. And we use combinations of those based on... The three most popular. Yeah. Right, right. And we have standard designs for each one of them, and we talk to security teams about picking, and they get a menu. I get, I get one of these, two of those, five of those. And um, the, the good part is it just gets plugged in and it's working within a few minutes. Mm -hmm. it, gets, it gets promoted to production that evening. It's mm -hmm. very predictable for us because you know, there's not a lot of variation. The rules, of, of course, each customer has their own security policy rules we have to implement. But the actual design configuration of the network, the firewalls, how we route the traffic, you know, where we jump on and off of the internet, um, how we try to keep as much of the critical traffic off of public networks, uh, we do um, uh, backdoor access to most of the larger cloud providers, things like that. Or we'll, of course, use DMZs for access out onto public domains. Mm -hmm. It's all standard stuff, and we do it the same way for each of the reference architectures. Awesome. Hey, is SDN something we should be looking forward to? Uh, I am so looking forward to SDN. Uh, 
um, much of the internal design strategy sessions we have about where we're taking these networks over the next five years revolve almost entirely around adoption of elements of SDN as they become commercially uh, you know, available and yeah. capable. Uh, one of the things we talked about at one point, you know, me and you, was the, the frustration we have that the SDN conversation has been dominated <laughs> by the sales guys from yeah, hardware manufacturers right. and the academics. The textbook, yeah. Yeah, the, the idea is there's, there's really two products being sold in the market as SDN today. And one is um, broadband failover at a router, which is not SDN, and you know, um, port management in a switch fabric in a data center, mm -hmm. which although that's SDN, that's very it's useful. very useful, right, right. but it has a very limited, yeah. you know, and obviously the carriers are rolling out their yeah. SDN-based capability. Absolutely. They'll come soon. Yeah, they, they will do dynamic bandwidth and flex bandwidth, particularly yeah. in the access legs where it's very yeah. expensive. Yeah. The key to SDN for the consumer someday is going to be as the end-to-end -end from the whole application process, from when, the, when, when a mobile user wants to click on uh, a request for data and it traverses the network, it goes to a web server, it goes to an application server, it goes to a database server, back to the application server, reroutes out to a, a third party vendor through an API, yeah. pulls down the data to the application server, back to web server, and, yeah. and back to the mobile device. All those hops all affect the user experience. They do. And nobody is, is able today to look at all of that. Most of what we've been focused on for the last years is the data collection around all those places in the network. Because then as controllers, uh, SDN controllers are developed to manage different elements of the infrastructure that that path took, they're going to need to talk together. They're going to need to federate, know that if the connection between the database server and the application server was now changed in behavior, it now takes longer, there's a buffering or queuing problem or something. Now all of a sudden, that controller needs to be able to be, be let known that that experience happened at the edge of the network. It identifies a problem through network management and goes in and makes a software change to that, you know, uh, ITU in our case, that caused the issue. The, that is a lot more sophisticated than the marketing folks in the industry are really mm -hmm. talking about. And it's going to, it's, it's not going to materialize quickly because everybody wants to make money on their controller for their objects within the infrastructure. And until those controllers can either share data through a common you know, clearinghouse in, into a separate server or service, we're not going to be able to change and manipulate the behavior of the network, where the problems and where the changes in, in application traffic occur. And that's when it's going to have an effect on the end user and their real experience. Um, because is what we're finding in at the SDN of today is you make one change, say, in a router. Right. You're, you create three more changes in the network that may have actually made the user experience worse, yeah. despite all the marketing around that great innovation on that one device. The promise of SDN is real. It's going to change how everybody uses technology. Yeah. It's going to make everything work smoother and faster. We have a long way to go before all the different problems in making that a reality get solved in the marketplace. You enjoy him being a CEO? Most days. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very practical answer. But you've been at it a long time. I have been. Uh, I have to admit, I didn't always enjoy my job as CEO. You know, it was a lot of fun in the early growth days. And then when the company was trying to reinvent itself and reimagine and figure out what it was going to be when it grew up, those were rough days. Well, and now that company, we're winning, yeah. it's it's great. I mean, we're on a fast track. We're we're making a big difference in the market, and it's fun again. Well, I love what you guys do. I think it's great for the security community. I like the contribution there, and I hope you keep doing it and keep growing and serving a lot of customers with nice uh, nice services. No, we plan on it. What we also hope that the gospel spreads and other companies and other IT service providers adopt this philosophy and strategy because we believe it will make networks much more secure. Well, our community is mostly security, so hopefully they're watching and they'll have some influence on the buy decision. Well, I hope so. We'll see. Go and talk to your CIOs. Tell them you can't, you can't secure a network that isn't stable and isn't standardized and doesn't use proper reference architecture designs. You heard it here first, right? Yep. There you go. Bruce, thanks for stopping by, man. Ed, pleasure. And we'll see you next time.